What are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time? All right, Joe, it's great to be with you today here on the Learning Leader Show. Welcome. Hi, Ryan. I'm happy to be here. I, I very much appreciate you asking me on. Sure. So you, uh, I was watching you give a speech. I think it was to the University of Miami. And mm -hmm. one of the things you brought up were, were three principles of leadership. And to start, I wanted to dig into to, to those because I found them really compelling in addition to your life story, which I also want to get to. But um, I believe you said the, the three principles that you really uh, adhere to are one, spiritual soundness, two, courage, and three, love. Could we yes. dig into each of those three? I think in the speech you focused on love the most, but I'm happy to go whichever one you are most um, curious about and want to talk about. But I'd like to hit those three since it seems like they're important to you. Uh, they are, Ryan, and I'm happy to handle that however you want to. So the background behind that is, um, my very first head high school job, which is Archmer Academy, Claymont, Delaware, I got when I was 22. I got, I'd already been coaching three years while I was in college, and I was fortunate enough to get this job. Had I not gotten that job, I would have tried to go to Wall Street. And uh, by the way, Joe Biden graduated from Archmer and actually played football there. So I thought about what, what is this drives me to really want to coach? What is it? And it's got to be more than the X's and O's. And, I said, it's got to have something to do with the impact I'm going to have on my guys. And you know, uh, how do you help a boy really become a man? You know, these are the high school level guys. Same thing I'd say for college. And I said, there's got to be something to that. So in my first high school play, this is written. And my first high school playbook, this was 1971. Uh, it said, we're going to have a program it's about, about becoming men. Uh, but it's not some tough, ma tough macho guy, a real man. And actually, I raised my daughters on this. And this was the same standard I've had in my personal life and in my professional life in football and Wall Street, back to football. Uh, and it's held up pretty well for me. Stand on your own two feet, take responsibility for yourself. I added later on when I was in Merrill Lynch, always treat others with dignity and respect and live with the consequences of your actions. So except for live with, uh, treat others with dignity and respect, which I added later, I, that was 1971. And I thought that really made sense. So we talked about that all the time. I said, you, you, got, you got to take responsibility for yourself. And then you get involved with like how that works with regard to excuses. And when you start to go through the excuses, you see, yeah, really, there are no excuses. You got to be, you can be wrong sometimes. That's okay. We got to be able to handle that. Okay. So that begins with that. That begins with everything stems from that. Now, we called it BAM uh, when I went back to football just because. I got 125 guys, players, got another 20, 25 coaches, analysts, interns, et cetera. So I had all male. So bam, and it's a logo, it's trademarked, it's kind of all over the campus, on the back of the jerseys. Um, I actually changed, put on a good shirt for you, but I was wearing something that said bam. And um, uh, the, that, that, that's, but not all meant to be sexist. Like I said, look at it as a leadership acronym. Most time, my children are raising their children on BAM. They say, you got to BAM up, TJ. That would be my daughter talking to her son. And uh, so, okay, so with that as a background, then the three, the three principles within that is spiritual soundness, courage, and love. So that's the background, but everything stems from BAM. And what does so BAM stand for? Have, be a man. Oh, yeah, yeah, man. yeah, we missed that. that. That's why I referenced that it's not sexist. It's, look at it as a leadership background. Like, be a man. A real man is somebody that does it. A real woman, a real leader, is somebody that does that. What does is, what is courage, like what does it mean to be courageous in your mind? It means you have the guts to do what you believe is really the right thing. So even if, even if, um, uh, even if it may not be to your advantage near term, even though, uh, you know, you may not get the promotion right away, even though uh, you may not get the reward, whatever that might be, a real man has the guts to do what they really believe is right. And then you can kind of get into examples of those. So, so one example, from, like one of the things that I talk to my players about a lot is I think the single greatest threat in the globe today is terrorism. So terrorism, uh, 
I, I want my, my team, my people to understand what that really is, and, and where it began, how it began, how it gets funded, how they market, how they teach, how they recruit, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so we've got hundreds of thousands, we've got, we live in the greatest country in the world, right? But there are hundreds of thousands of people who would not hesitate to give up their lives because they think we're evil, and they, their whole family may very well be rewarded afterwards. So uh, if we're going to do that, we're going to do that right. But how do we defend ourselves? We've got to do it through the military. Well, who runs the military? You really have senior politicians, senior po po political leaders, and you have senior military leaders. And there are so often you do something that might be in your best interest, but you're making real decisions for the future of our country, near term and long term. I mean, it's truly, truly national security. So to what extent does the general, the two-star general think first, I got to become a three-star, or the senator that's in charge of the, the chair of the particular committee, uh, I gotta get reelected. Right? Then you're not putting that responsibility first. So the guts to do what you believe is right. Now within that, we play a lot of roles, right? So uh, father, spouse, friend, coach, uh, all the different, my sibling, all the different things you have, you have in your life, uh, the world, we live in a litigious society and the world tries to regulate. So if you look at the NCAA manual, it's like a gazillion pages. You look at the tax code, like 50, 60,000 pages. A golf manual, 110 pages. Uh, it takes 15 minutes to try to figure out where you're supposed to drop your ball when you hit it someplace. Uh, it's stupid. It's just stupid. Uh, the, so so it's, it's, you can't legislate ethics, whether it be business or perfect. Or, or personal, or prof yeah, or personal, so or professional. So at the end of the day, the reality is we really know the difference between right and the difference between wrong. And a real leader does what they believe is right, regardless of the long term, regardless of the near term consequences to that. And, and then there are examples of that. So to give a quick, quick example, uh, President Truman uh, had to make a decision as to whether or not. So if you, military history tells us that we were getting ready to invade Japan. Um, and he had to make a decision as to whether or not we we're going to drop the atom bomb. Now think about it. We talk about, you know, <laughs> do I do this? Do I do that? Never in history has something like this taken place before. He's got to make a decision. And you got a lot of po political, he's got a lot, a lot of political advisors. And the political advisors say, no, that's not going to be popular. That's going to, screw up your career, that's good. But he had to make a pretty serious decision. So he makes the decision that we're gonna drop the bomb. And you know, I, I 40, 60, 70,000, 100,000, whatever it was, people lost their lives, but it did this, it ended the war. And had we sent, uh, had we sent troops there, we could very well have lost uh, close to a million soldiers. As it was, we didn't lose a soldier. We're going, to, we're going to lose on. So think about he making the decision and the stress and the pressure that he had to do what he believed is the right thing. So it's easy to reference examples as they start to pop up. But that's that's what courage is. So a real leader, right? So he really takes responsibility for himself, uh, is responsible for other people, does what they believe is right. They don't do what they believe. They don't do what they, do. they don't do what they think is wrong. What about? Um love this was a big one you told a kind of an emotional story about your mom um and, and also about your son and 9 11. uh i'd love for for you to maybe maybe share uh where love comes from okay so i think what a lot of leaders don't get is not about you it's not about your ego it's not about showing how smart you are it's not how good you look on television it's not how good good you handle yourself in a boardroom or in a stadium what have you this is about your people and the real leader understands that. And the real leader really gets that. So love to me, that is, is the power of love. And the love to me then is the commitment. Everything should have a little bit of a definition so it's clear. The commitment to the well-being of others. So a lot of times, you know, use foot, any team, but use football as an example because there are, there, there are a lot of players there. Um, you know, you've got to do something where you give up something yourself, sacrifice some of yourself for the betterment of the team. Everybody gets that. Everybody, everybody nods their head. Now, you give the military, for example, if you've got, if you've got, uh, you know, you've interviewed, uh, you know, special, special ops guys, 
Uh, well, they got to work together in a team. And everything they do is for the benefit of the other one. If they screw up, somebody's going to get killed. Uh, you know, we screw up a football. Well, we, we're going to not get a first down. You know, we may lose a game. Now, I don't like losing a game. That's very painful. But it's not the same thing as you know, doing something that, that, that messes up, uh, takes somebody else's life away. So it's the commitment well-being of others. Now, and some team, uh, businesses do that. Now, the business might be this bit, you know, Meritrader. 13,000 people, so it's this big. But what I'm looking for is each of the people that run the respective areas to recognize that this is about well-being of others. So I want everybody thinking that way. So in the business world, if your people believe, or if football, anything, your people, your children, your people really, really believe that you have their best interests at heart. And you got to be confident, right? You got to be confident. Mm-hmm. But you know, they're going to lead you. They're going to want to be with you. They're going to want to because they, because they know that. All right, so where does that stem from? And then I go back. I think where people really feel this and see this, and then the, the, that same concept carries over to, to the uh, commitment to the well-being of others, I think is in the family. And that's why I shared the story about my mom and I shared the story about my son. I'd glad to do that again if you'd like me to. Yeah, please. Okay, so uh, my father was born in Italy, came here when he was 11. Never spoken, uh, never finished eighth grade. Uh, so foods and vegetables, uh, over the span of his entire lifetime. I worked for him from the time I was 10 to the time I was 22. And, uh, and, uh, my mom was born in Ireland, came here and never finished 10th grade. We lived in the Dighton Street section of New York City, which then was very much a gang area. Uh, I was the oldest of five. Seven of us lived in a two bedroom and bathroom apartment. I thought this was terrific. My father had his own business, you know. They have to worry about what we're going to eat. And, uh, but it was, it, was, it was a tough neighborhood. I began drinking when I was 10. It wasn't beneath me to steal. Uh, 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 getting a fight all the time. And, um, but that was, that was the only life that I, that I knew. And we had a family meeting one time when I was 13. And I, I did recognize, did recognize that my mom was the only person from her family that had come over here. So they got married in Mount Carmel Parish in the Arthur Avenue section of the Bronx, about 10 blocks from Fordham University. It's the same neighborhood where they filmed the Bronx Tale. And when she walked down the aisle, she came here from Ireland. Nobody in her family or friends could afford to come over. There was not one person in the church that she knew from home or grew up with, but not one member of her family. So, and my father, uh, you know, he could be tough sometimes, and but he was working 14 hours a day, six days a week. He was focused on the store and what he needed to do. And I think with my mom, she had an incredible attitude, but without question, she unconditionally loved us. Uh, we were her life. And again, remember, she had no family, but we, us, she's 100% responsible for us. And, uh, and I, think, I think she was incredible with that, but that was her life. So all of a sudden, we find out she's got to go to the hospital for something, but it's just a routine. Things come out a couple of days, no big deal. I didn't think too much of it. She got in a hospital, and I was the oldest. I know she got a hospital, you know, to have my brothers and sisters. So I didn't think too much of it. And I mentioned it was a two bedroom apartment. There were seven of us. It wasn't like you had a lot of privacy. I remember seeing dad on, kneeling by his bed, and he was crying. Now, my dad died of Alzheimer's about eight or nine, 10 years ago. I don't remember my father ever crying in his life. I never saw my father cry, except this time. So I just said, that what's the matter? And he said, I'm just worried about mom. And that's so much still in my head. I remember him saying that. I remember where he was at the time. And I worried about mom. And then you know, that night, I kind of go to bed. He said, you know, can I help you? No, no, it's okay. So I went to go to bed that night. And the three brothers slept in the same room. And I couldn't fall asleep, but I kept thinking, dad's crying. But mom, this got to be, this is not a routine. Thing. This is something, something's the matter. This is very, very serious. Something's going on. Here. And it hit me, if it was that serious, well, then the potential risk could be what? It could, could potentially want to be fatal. So I started to think that, oh my God, who's my mom? And I started thinking about that. And I started to think, what matters to her? We matter to her. And again, we, everything to her. And I never told that one lady I loved her, and I loved her totally. I, I loved her deeply. I would give her all my life for her. And uh, again, but I was a 13-year-old gang kid. I was a badass. 
I remember going through that night, it was very, very painful. I remember really praying. I said, oh God, please bring my my prayer and I'll make sure that never happens again. Well, she did come back and it didn't happen again. So then you fast forward and I had just moved out to Omaha to take the Ameritrade job. As it turns out, three of my kids now were living in Brooklyn and two of them were appointed because actually at New York City apartment. And, um, and, and two of them were working in Merrill Lynch. Now, I spent 17 years in Merrill Lynch and I had an apartment. I live in Battery Park City, which is actually where I am right now. And um, uh, so my home was a couple hundred yards from the World Trade Center. Merrill Lynch headquarters is about 100 yards from the World Trade Center. I have two kids that are working at Merrill Lynch. And this is my home. I kind of hear now I'm in Omaha and I see things going on. And another thing a leader, is important for a leader, you need to recognize really what you can control. How, prior art is very, very critically important and need to recognize what you can control. So this is a major thing. We got a firm potentially going out of business. I've got employees I got to make sure I keep safe. I've got clients whose assets I got to make sure we're responsible for. So we go into emergency mode and try to take care of things. Now, I was certainly concerned about what was going on in New York, but I couldn't do anything. So I tried to keep that in my head. So my daughter, Kim, was thoughtful enough thinking that that's probably what was going on. And she called me and said, Dad, I'm sure you're in, you're in emergency mode, but I, I'm sure you're also concerned about Karen and Kevin. And I talked to each of them. They're both okay. Ah, Kim, thank you. I really appreciate it. And then I'll call you a little later. Kind of uh, Kim, I love you. That's great. Thank you. So then a couple hours later, she called me and said, Dad, I talked to Kara. They Maryland's evacuated everybody in Jersey City. She is stressed out, but Dad, she's okay. But the last time anybody saw Kevin, he was on, he was, on his way over to the site to see if he could help out. Now, by then, both buildings had collapsed. And, uh, and nobody could find Kevin. And I remember thinking a little bit similar, but different circumstances, a little bit similar to the situation with my mom. I said, I, good chance I may have lost my son. And I'm still trying to stay in emergency mode, Ameritrade, but I couldn't get this out of my head. And what I had, though, was it, eerie sense of, I, I don't think you can underestimate the heartache, you know, losing a child anyway, but something like that. I'm thinking there's a real possibility that may have happened, but I had a sense of peace with that because if, remember, if my mom had passed, I would have regretted the rest of my life that I not told her I loved her. Well, that helped me the rest of my life. And with my children, Kevin was about 22, 23 at the time. There is not one thing, if I knew he was going to pass that next day, there's not one thing I would have wanted to tell him, but I had not already told him. Mm. So again, it's the commitment of well-being of others. And that happened because of the experience I had with my mother. So you take the power of that. Like people feel like there's power in that. They get that because of the family. They get that because, okay, it's my parents, it's my child. They feel that. So, okay, you take that feeling and you bring that to the other responsibilities that you've done in life. And you recognize that in part of that responsibility is you have to love people you're responsible for. And what that means is you're committed to their well-being. Then you go back to whether you're a football coach, whether you're, you're a business leader, uh, when your people or your family or your loved ones believe that you really have your best interests at heart and they also got to feel like competent, you know what you're doing, they'll follow you anywhere. And that allows you significant competitive advantage over others that don't do it that way. Hmm. So you may be much smarter than I am in a particular area, but it could be very, very, very difficult for you to beat my team in that because this is part of the base we're on. Plus we're competent, plus we got a good strategy, plus we got those things. Uh, and so that's been a big part well, of- No, I, uh, I really appreciate you sharing, especially the personal stories. Um, when it comes to uh your career it's it's pretty remarkable uh everything you. that you've done and that you're currently doing uh, w whenever someone gets a role like uh to be the ceo of a giant company like you've earned i'm always curious about the path and what like seminal moments or inflection points along that path that you could have went left or right and maybe you chose one thing versus something else and because of a series of choices in a series of, of, of behaviors by you, you then become the CEO of TD Ameritrade. Can you, can you share maybe whether it's one or two 
of those moments along the way that I think eventually catapulted you to getting a job that is, is very, very few people in the world have a job like that. Like, how did that happen? Brian, if you, you may find it interesting, as I can link, but Ben, you're responsible for yourself, period. You're responsible for yourself. So, um, uh, and that comes up in everything that you do. And then the spiritual soundness, the courage thing, and the love things that come up. So, uh, if I share with you, if I may, if I share with you kind of how I made the most significant decision I had to make in my life, I can reference the spiritual signs piece, the courage piece, and the love piece if that works. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So, all right. So, uh, I'm uh, I'm in high school. Uh, I told you I grew up in a gang area. Two of my very best friends that I was with every day in grammar school got killed in high school. One died of a drug overdose. The other was killed by the police while at a liquor store. I would not have been with a guy with the drugs, but if I hadn't been playing high school football, I would have been with a guy robbing the liquor store. Not a maybe, I'm positive I would have done that. And these are guys are with every day. I, 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 I went to Fordham Prep, which is an old boys Catholic school in the Bronx. So that was very much out of my neighborhood, very different from my neighborhood. Plus, I did have I did have a good family structure. Not everybody in that neighborhood did. And my father's own business. And he expected when I was in school, I'd be working in the food store. So um, uh, my goal was to play football and baseball in college. Instead, ultimately, my uh, girlfriend winds up getting pregnant, and uh, I feel responsible for that. So I got to give up sports, and I got to take care of my family. My father's advice to me was, well, don't go to college. You won't, you know, you got to take care of your family. So work with me in the food store now. I felt I really had to go to college. And I really, really thought about it hard. Really kept thinking about it. That I think got to do is you're saying you're making a big mistake now. <laughs> think of the situation I'm in at the time. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be a father. I'm going to be a husband. I'm thinking I got to go to college. There's no money. And my father's telling me it's a big, a big mistake. So I begin to afford them. Uh, because they believe they had to do that. Uh, you'll see with all this connection in a second. So, but I support my wife, do what I got to pay every dime my education. So, my freshman year, I'm driving a truck to the post office, a yellow cab in New York City, and working for my father in the food store. <laughs> Probably not the most fun a college freshman has ever had. And it was also the first year of my life where I didn't have sports. So, I went to Fordham University, was on the same campus as Fordham Prep, and I had a good career at Fordham Prep. They offered me a coaching job. And I thought that was great. So, I love that. So for five months a year or four months a year, I'm coaching high school football. And the rest of the time, I'm working at my father's food store. I major in economics. I was always intrigued by Wall Street. Not because it was in my family. You know, you did stock exchange until it seemed exciting. I kind of liked economics. I could see where it could relate to business. And I thought, you no, know, Wall Street is kind of where I want to go. And uh, that was the plan. But by the, my third season, it was my senior year in college. I really loved the coaching. Really, really, really loved it. And I chose that, that. I thought that was the direction I needed to go. Now, I was going to, I was I went for sure career coaching if I got a head job, head high school job. If not, I'm going to try to go to Wall Street, probably apply to 100 places. I become the first, the youngest head coach in the history of the state of Delaware in Archbishop Academy where President Biden went. All right. I pursued that career. I want to be the head coach one day, you know, major, major school. And it's going along pretty well. I write a book on football, pretty successful. Uh, and then I move on to the defensive coordinator at Dartmouth. And uh, in our, by then, uh, Dartmouth's in Hanover, New Hampshire, pretty cold in the wintertime. By then, we have four kids, same, you know, my high school sweetheart. We have four kids, and I'm in the middle of a staff meeting, and the sheriff from town comes in and he needs to see me. And I think, oh my God, there's an accident. Somebody's barely hurt or dead. And, uh, so my heart's kind of pounding. He says, Coach, I'm just really sorry. He has me divorced papers. Now, I can't afford to live independently and I can't afford, and still take care of my four children and my wife. So I get permission to move into a storage room by the football office. It had no heat. I could see my breath in the wintertime. It was cold in New Hampshire in the wintertime. I lived there for two years. I still always wanted to be a head coach, but I got to figure out, you know, <laughs> I, I still got to take care of my family. So in January 1984, Ryan, Miami significantly, Miami upset Nebraska for the national championship. Huge upset. 
And uh, there's a little bit more of a story behind that, but to kind of get to the point, uh, they offered me an opportunity to go there and be their defensive coordinator. So in the 80s, Miami was it. Every one of those guys got major college jobs, NFL jobs, it was it. And they were the dark team in defense. So I can go from defense court in the Ivy League, the defense court in the national championship team. I cannot have a better career back. It can't even come close. Uh, but back then, we didn't make much money. I'm going to live with Carl Gables. My kids are still going to live in Hanover, New Hampshire. And uh, a coach works seven days a week, 80 hours a week. Literally, you don't get a day. They go off for probably five months unless you have a bye week. They maybe get one day. And it's a, t- a tough grind. Then you've got to be on the road. You're recruiting, doing all those things. Toughest career decision I've ever made because you're the greatest career opportunity I've had in my entire life. That includes up until now. And uh, I turned it down. I turned it down because I didn't think I could do my job as a coach, but I couldn't live, live up to my responsibility as a father. So is this okay, Ryan? I'm going in yeah, the right direction. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. All right. So, okay. So and I'm going to show you how it was all connected. Um, so what was the other thing that I really wanted to do? The other thing I really wanted to do is Wall Street. So, I hustled as much as I possibly could. Ultimately, Maryland gave me an opportunity to put me in an institutional MBA training program. There were 26 of us. There were 25 MBAs from Harvard, Stanford, et cetera, and one football coach. And everybody says, this football guy, I didn't know how to spell the word bond. I didn't know what an equity was. And um, uh, I didn't even know how we were supposed to dress. Like, a senior guy took me off the floor one day. He said, you got to get yourself a suit. I don't have enough money for a suit. He goes, find the money, steal the money, do what you got to do. But Alexander's in the Bronx, get yourself a suit. So I actually bought myself a three-piece suit with two pairs of pants. And I had about three shirts and two, three different ties. I had that as well I had for a year and a half. That's where we were every day. And um, so to get back to so I, so, uh, so I, I, the uh, it turned out pretty good at, 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 at Merrill. Later on, most of those MBAs were working for me. Had a great run there. Couldn't be prouder of it. And we were a double A plus firm. We're a global name. Uh, it's I had a great, I had a great career there. I was one of one of our more senior executives in the world for us. And uh, the dot com bubble burst and very serious recession in March two thousand, March two thousand three. A lot of firms that really struggling. Ameritrade's going out of business. I had remarried in nineteen ninety five. Uh, so this is around 2000 and, um, bottom line is I take the job and I move from New York City to Omaha, Nebraska. I get there. I really realize there's a significant chance I'm going to business. I was misled in a couple of things and, uh, that became a bit of a concern. Bottom line, we figured out, did a great job. In 2008, I stepped down and, um, the board asked me to be chairman, which I'm very, very proud of. I was chairman for 11 years until we closed the uh, Schwab deal. And that's why I stepped down altogether from that. So I had to really think about that. All right, now, we had a 500% return for our shareholders in my last five years. That includes the financial crisis. We're not a public, publicly traded financial company in the globe that could touch that. Nobody, not Warren Buffett, not J.P. Morgan, not Goldman Sachs, nobody. And we're a little old Ameritrade. If we were a college football program, I'd like to say that we would have won the national championship. It wouldn't be Alabama with the national championship. It would have been, at the time, I'd say Wake Forest. With the season we had last year, yeah, it would have been Coast Carolina winning the national championship. Uh, so if Coast Carolina won the national championship, what kind of a job offers would that guy get? That's kind of where I was while the world was imploding. So I had credible, credible offers, all sorts of different things. But I, I didn't step down for that reason. I stepped down because I thought there might be something else I want to do with my life, and I can't do that if I'm totally responsible and bam for Ameritrade and people that. Uh, then I get a call from a group of alumni at Yale telling me at the end of the two, 2008 season was a chance the football job would be open, would it be interesting? I said, guys, I haven't coached football for over 20 years. They said, but we've really spent some time looking at the skill sets college co- head coach is supposed to have. We think you not only have those, but you have prepared advantage. There's no one problem. What's that? We're 135 years of college football. Nothing like this has ever happened. Uh, think about it. I, I did. Bottom line is about six months later, I decided I'm going to do it. And, uh, uh, but I only would what, what I want ultimately to be, you know, a division one head coach. And uh, I and where I wanted. And I began at Nebraska and ultimately wound up in Coastal Carolina. Now, how does all this fit together with regards to how you make decisions, et cetera? 
it begins with, I am responsible for myself. But as a leader, I also am responsible for my family. I'm responsible for my people. I'm responsible for all these other things. Uh, so you begin with that. But how do you know what you're going to do? So go, go back to senior year in college. And I got to make it. I want to go to Wall Street. But I'm willing to not even pursue that. And I'm living in New York. Wall Street's in New York. And I thought at Archmere in the deep south, at Delaware. I thought Delaware was the deep south. They never went like 10 miles outside of New York City. So I really spent a lot of time thinking about this. And I told you my first head high school playbook, I talked about the band. Under that, I said, this is built on spiritual soundness. I actually had four pillars then. Spiritual soundness, dedication, courage, and love. Eventually, the time I get rid of dedication. Spiritual soundness, courage, and love. How does that work here? So most people really don't know who they are. And they think how, you're only going to be happy if you feel good about yourself. How you feel good about yourself probably is the decisions that you make under stress. And you want most of them to be the right decision. All right, so one of those is career path because you got to spend a lot of time in that particular area. And if it's not something you enjoy, not something you cut out for, you're not going to be happy. Uh, so if you don't feel productive, you're not going to be happy. So how do, you, how do you figure this out? Plus, I remember, remember my father in the food store. I worked in the food store for 12 years. You know, and dad was not easy to work with or anyway. So that wasn't a whole lot of fun. So I felt I needed to do something that, that I, I, I loved doing. That was the coach. Now, the way you go about this, we tend to be a composite of the people around us. It's basic human nature. You want to be able to, uh, you know, uh, make people happy, make people like you. So you have a little different pers perspective or persona uh, with your girlfriend versus your best friend versus a teammate versus a classmate versus your father versus your mother versus a cousin versus your sibling versus a teacher, et cetera. And you really don't know who you are. I, I really do believe that most of us really don't think we do, but we don't. That's why we make a lot of bad decisions under stress, although we don't realize it at the time. So spiritual science exercise is something that I went through. What I went through was I took a legal pad, and I write down everything that was about me, everything I knew about me. Who am I really? What are my favorite colors? What kind of, at the time, I'm a father, I'm a husband. What kind of father? What kind of husband? Uh, uh, you know, how am I thinking of care of myself physically? What's my favorite colors? Or, or, or what's my favorite music? I just keep writing. Just keep writing, keep writing, keep writing, keep writing. And then I stepped away for a for while, for a while. Then I went back to it. I, was honest, I probably changed 25% of it. And I was being dead honest, but I said, I don't, I don't really love that type of music. I love that type of music because that's what my girlfriend liked. You know, and I kind of wanted to, you know, show her I was cool. And I, you know, I can't think this way because of my father. Or this way because, so what is it I like? I probably, then he's changing. Right, so you get to the point, though, where you really understand who you are. And that gives you peace of mind. I know who you are. Most people don't. So for me, you really got to find a better advantage. This is the better advantage. Most people don't know who they, who they are. So I do. And happiness is going to be decided by the decisions you can make under stress. Knowing who you are, increase the probability you're going to make the right decision. So let's get back to what am I going to do now? I'm a senior in high school, senior in college. I'm a father, I'm a husband, I gotta pick the right career path. It's gotta be something I think I care about. So what are the skill sets to go to Wall Street? What are the skill sets, right? Then we got that for. What are the skill sets to be a coach? I wrote them all down, I spent time doing that. But I knew my skill sets and I matched my skill sets to those skill sets. I said, I got those skill sets. And then I decided, well, is this something I really love doing? The answer was yes. So I wound up picking my career path as a senior based on what I just did. That was just my spiritual soundness exercise. And I picked my career path to go to coaching. When I got my first team, I began with BAM, and then the spiritual soundness courage look underneath that. All right, so, all right, now move forward a little bit. Now, uh, I talked about my career path a little bit, and I wanna be the head coach at a major, major school. We picked the school, and um, I get an opportunity to go to the national champion and ultimately, ultimately be their defensive corner. There's no job in the world that can be better for me. Spirit for sound, got to do it, got to do it, got to do it. But I also have the commitment of my family. So which, is, which do I have to live up to more? Courage, the guts to do what you believe is right, 
is the reason why I made the decision I did. I turned down the job. I, I didn't think I could live with myself. And therefore, I would not be as good a coach as I, I should be if I can't live up to responsibility, uh, being the responsibility of, of my children, be, uh, if I'm not a good father. So spiritual science, courage, love all part of that. Now, I get an opportunity to go to Meritrade. And I do spiritual science exercise. I'm part of a great firm that cares about me. These you guys think they're going out of business. And I had to do some pretty good due diligence. And I went through all those things, all those things. And I said, I want to, I, I had accumulated a little bit of wealth because of my seniority at, at Merrill Lynch. And um, I decided that if, if the firm was good enough to let me keep my stock, I would take the job. I normally said, no, you can't, you can't do that. But they were telling me America is going out of business. So we certainly did. They didn't think, certainly we weren't going to be competitive with Merrill Lynch. And I actually told us you at the time, I said, I said Dave Kamansky, I said, Dave, I know I'm asking you for something special and I know it's out of your name, but here's what I'm going to tell you. If you don't give me the stock, I can't go. And the reason why I can't go is because I can't risk everything I've earned over 17 years. With the, I, can't, I can't sacrifice for, the, for my family. If you let me keep it, then I can go and I put myself at risk. Work it out, great. We don't work it out, so good. So that again, so even though I thought I wanted to take the Ameritrade job, I would not have taken it if I had put what I had earned over my lifetime at risk because I had to look more responsibility again to my family. So you got a spiritual science piece, and then you got a courage piece in there. You got a love piece in there. Then I wanted to put Ameritrade. Okay, fast forward now. There were a couple of approaches that were made to me during my tenure as CEO. And one was the possibility of Tag Lee who was retiring from the, from the NFL as commissioner. Is this something that I'd have interest in? And I would have loved to kind of do something like that. My background, uh, business of football. Uh, and the, the, he was going to set down 2006. I was approached in 2004. Actually, with two different groups. But we're not going to talk about this. And, uh, you know, see, now, by the way, I think if we had pursued that, I'm not saying Goodell would not have gotten the job. He probably would have gotten the job, but I bet you I would have been, <laughs> I would have definitely been on the short list for that job. I would love that. So 2006, Spencer Stewart is doing a search, but we had just bought uh, TD Waterhouse, Ameritrade bought TD Waterhouse, TD Group in Canada, and that made us TD, Water, uh, TD Ameritrade. And it was gonna take three years to do the integration. And that was my responsibility. And there's a lot of things going on, a lot of money, a lot of people, a lot of assets, all sorts of things. I could not take that job. I could not even interview for that job. It's my responsibility was here. Again, let's do what you believe is right, to the well being of others, uh, the love piece. Uh, spiritual science, we're back to spiritual science now. I think, okay, now I can certainly continue. We've done a great job. But if I want to do something else, I got to step down. Spiritual science says, I step down. And I don't know what I want to do, but I knew it might be something. And I didn't want to go another five, six years and then never have the opportunity to, to, to do something else. Football, that was a spiritual exercise that lasted a while. Oh, and I was with Bo Pelini in Nebraska for two years. And part of the reason why I went there, first I had to get the rust off. It was an hypothesis for me. Do I really still have the skill sets? Is this something I still have the passion for? Because nobody's going to give me a great team. I'm going to probably lose in the beginning, blah, 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 blah. Am I going to be able to handle that? The decision. So that's the span and also making the decision to step down, you know, 2018. I'm still responsible for football at Coastal Carolina, by the way. And uh, every one of those exercises, I am the one responsible. Here are the just fan of my responsibilities. Spiritual soundness, knowing who I am, really knowing who I am, allows me to make significant decisions under stress. Uh, I do have the guts most of the time, not always. I have failed, but to do what I believe is right when nobody's watching, nobody's going on my head. And uh, uh, I know I have the well being of others, you know, in the position I have and the position that I'm in. Now, I know that was kind of long winded, but it kind of went through my entire career. Yeah, there. no, I, I mean, appreciate you see that. really where really right, how the band, spiritual science, courage, love apply. I'm curious. Um... So when you're you're leading as the CEO, uh, one of the critical components to a leadership role, especially one like that, is who 
you decide to hire, who you decide to promote, right? Who do you, who you decide to surround yourself with? Cause, cause that job can, is, I can't even imagine all the different decisions and things you do. So I'm curious, Joe, what, what are some of the kind of must have qualities in a person for you to say, yes, I want them to be a leader within my business reporting to me. Uh, I, you always, I've always looked for competitive advantages. I, everybody says that, but they don't come up with competitive advantages. A lot of times teams, organizations, businesses are successful because they do things similar to what other people do. They just do it better. Yep. That's not a good thing. So, well, that's competitive advantage. So how do you do those types of things better than somebody else? But you also have to find competitive advantages along the way. So, to me, uh, let's just assume for a moment that if I need to hire a CFO, then here's the appropriate financial background to do the job. Let's assume that's good. Then everybody's going to give you the same message. Oh, you've got to be a team player. You've got to be dedicated. You've got to be this. You've got to have integrity. You've got to be trust them. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. True. We'll put that aside. Um, more than anything else, I want the person, I want, I have to have a feeling, I have to know how we handle or she handles herself under stress hmm. because that's the criticality and that's the differentiator. I got to know that. I got to figure that out. Um, uh, so that'd be one thing. Now in the business world, I never used the term BAM, but I use the term, I, I expect you to take full responsibility with that, that there are no excuses then. No, you can't have excuses. Um, we can talk about that too in a little bit if you want to. We have some pretty good stories there, but you can't, can't make excuses. And this is your responsibility. You got to live with the consequences of your actions. You're responsible for these people. So without saying bam, I, ex I expect you to embrace that standard. Mm -hmm. Embrace the standard. Because if you don't, if you don't, your job's going to be out of line. So mm -hmm. I'm assuming they have the skill sets. Do they have, do I believe they will really truly take responsibility and live up to that? Again, have the best service of the people, everything associated with BAM. Uh, and when the shit hits the fan, the world's blowing up and you got the financial crisis or 2001, two, you know, Meritrade going out of business or you have this team and you know, you're losing, everybody's injured, you're playing with the seventh string quarterback. Uh, how do you handle yourself then? How do you handle yourself when you got really, really problems at home? going through a divorce or you got you got a kid that's that terminally ill how do you handle yourself under those situations that to me is the person i want to hire how do you how do you figure that out through the course of an interview process like that's really hard i would imagine to understand so how do you so how do you make yeah. that call then how do you choose right. so every friends? everybody so early on if i'm bringing somebody in let's say from graduate school like early on like merrill lynch and, you know, uh, I'm not even in management yet, but they would use me to interview some of the guys. So I have no idea, but I still have this philosophy. I mean, I had this as a coach first time around. So I want to be begin, and then I have any background, you know, they're all like hotshot students. Some of them may have been athletes, but they are coming from Harvard, Wharton, wherever it might be. And, um, and the street recruits them. And the recruiting, they kiss their ass, especially if they really, really want them. So they come into my office, and I do everything I can to make it really uncomfortable. So I don't get up. You know, I probably think he's some douchebag, but that's okay. I don't get up. <laughs> and, hey, hold on a minute. And I make me do something else more important. I said, yeah, sit, sit down, sit down. And they say, hold on a second. I'm not finished this. And uh, then I think every time I remember picking up the phone and talking to my assistant, my secretary, I said, I said by the way, uh, I'm interviewing with, what's your, name? what's your name? Yeah, I'm interviewing here with John. I said, but... If these two people call, interrupt right away because that's more important. I said, okay, well, John, tell you what. I've already looked at your resume, so I know what's on your resume. I know what you've done. I've read it two times. And actually, I was kidding. I do know your name. And I said, so, but we can hire anybody we want to. Uh, uh, Merrill Lynch, Ameritrade, whether it's true or not, this is where I'm beginning. Coastal Carolina, uh, anybody we want to. Anybody we want to. I want you to tell me why we should hire you that's it so i want to know hmm. so the person you first of all the person i'm comfortable because i made them uncomfortable and uh then how do they handle themselves almost always they start to talk about their resume 
oh, you know, I worked really hard and I did this and I got into Harvard. I said, whoa, 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 hold it. I said, I didn't want to hear this. I said, I know that. I said, you got to tell me. Take, see, here's your resume. I read it. It's over there. Okay, don't tell me anything on the resume. Tell me what we should I do. And the, the person that I want to see from them that they really thought this through, spiritual status, even though they haven't gotten to the exercise, but they really understand kind of what they, like, and I do have these skill sets, and these are the skill sets you need to be successful in this role. I got those skills. That's what I'm looking for this guy to do, or the lady to do. But I'm looking for, I know they're uncomfortable, and I want to see how they handle themselves. All right, so that's one. So let's say we get through that. I don't make that easy. As I see, see, don't tell me, don't tell me again about what was on your resume. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to have an interview right away. So I put them under stress. But the second thing I asked them, what is the most difficult thing you've ever gone through in your life? And how'd you handle it? So I got some answers were like, you know, wow, they moved me. Uh, someone sounded like that to me growing up. But I said, I'm like, oh, that's stressful. I remember one guy said, oh, you know, when I was, uh, when I was, uh, <laughs> when I was trying to get into the fraternity and all those things, and I said, okay, this guy's off the list. So, have so like, that's the biggest, the most stress you've ever had in your life is getting into your fraternity. I said, okay, well, you know, that's not going to work. So, um, so at the end of the, whether I think the kid's good or not, whether the guy's good or the lady's good or not, you know, then I kind of like embrace him a little bit. Kind of, I, just, like I said, I, I intentionally try to, you know, make it uncomfortable for you because I think to be successful in this career path, you got to be able to handle yourself under stress. That was the reason why I did that. But I, I get, get a great resume, get a great future, blah, blah, good luck. And then, yeah, so that's how I handle that. Now let's move forward. Now I'm handling uh, a coach, a seasoned coach, or I'm handling uh, an executive. Well, they have history. They'll have a history. So most of the time, if you write down somebody, if I have somebody as a reference in my resume, I can guarantee you, he's going to say, or she's going to say something really good about me. Other than I'm not going to put them down. So I put somebody that's not going to do a good job taking care of me, then I'm a dope, right? So I don't want to get a dope, but I'm not going to waste time in talking to anybody you got references. But I got to do my homework. So if you, Merrill Lynch, if you were working at Goldman Sachs, there are people at Goldman Sachs that some of my people are going to know that have worked with you. I can figure that out. I can figure out who's not on this list, who would have run a particular area that you would have been done. In the coaching world, I want to look at your film. And I look at your film. I said, okay, whoo, that was a bad quarter. I said, but, you know, the kid's hanging in, they're still playing tough, they made some mistakes. Or one guy makes a mistake, and then he kind of, she kind of takes two plays off. And I go, no, this, this guy, this, this kid, this coach knows how to handle this guy. And so, <clears throat> and there's probably somewhere that in his past as a coach, that either I know or I have a connection to. You got to work at it, but that's what I got to have. That's my better advantage. The most important thing I got to do is hire the right people. And I got to have the ability. Remember, beginning with you got to have confidence. I got to have the ability to handle yourself under stress, and it's got to have enough character to recognize that they're going to be responsible and no excuses, no bullshit, no games. Um, that's what I do. I, I, I'll give you a little thing I do in football when we're recruiting. I was the same thing. I think, what do you think the high school coach does? Oh, great kid, great kid, great kid. So this may even be illegal, but we figure out a way to get to the his, his worst subject, his teacher. And we're sorry, he's probably not allowed to do it. And uh, then we just say, hey, Mrs. Goldbaum, but you know, we're trying to hire, we're thinking about recruiting, we're recruiting Javon, and I know he's not very good at math, but what kind of kid is he? You know, just kind of, just tell me that. If they don't protect the kid. If they don't like the kid, they come in command. I think he's a big shot. He comes in, he does, 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 does a homework. That's always not doing well. Like he smarts in class. His body language is bad. Boom, he's got. He's done. Mm. He's done. All right? I'll tell you something else. You know, Javon's a good kid. He just sucks. <laughs> he just sucks at bad. But he's respectful. He turns on his thing. Boom, that matters a lot. The other thing I do is I don't let you come to campus without your family. And the reason for that is, number one, I think the way we run things, hopefully your parents are smart enough to appreciate this is a different type of program. But I want to see how you act in front of your parents. So the kid, remember, these are all high school stars. So the kid in front of his parents, like the mother says something, he rolls his eyes, boom, I don't want him. I don't want him. Uh, be respectful, kind of doing what you need to do. So, so I, 
I, I make great effort to do homework is most important decision I'm making. And then if I make the wrong decision, I got to have the guts to do what I believe is right. And I got to change that, fix it, fire, do what I need to do. So I got, I got to live with the consequences of my actions. Sure. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah. I mean, all of them are super in-depth. I really appreciate it. Just, just one more, Joe. Um, let's say there's somebody who's a bit earlier in their career. Maybe they graduated college a couple of years ago. They have a job right now. It's a good job. It's fine. Everything's going fine. But this person wants to kind of leave a dent in the world. They want to do their best to make an impact. They want to, they, they want to live with courage and love, right? Right. What, what are some general pieces of maybe one or two uh, of life slash career advice you'd give to that person? I think when, if we were to talk for five hours, which you would find an incredible consistency in what I say. There are a lot of anecdotes, a lot of stories, a lot of examples, but it's incredible consistency. So, for example, I'm not even hesitating on this. I will give him the best life and career advice anybody's going to give him on the planet. I'm going to say, I'm going to go to spiritual sinus. I'm going to tell you about everything we just talked about. And I'm going to say, that's what you got to begin with. Now, the one thing I would add that I didn't say before is, when you're doing all this writing, you write it, and just like you said, you write it all down, write it all write it down, take a break, come back to it, write it down again, and then you do your homework. What are the three things you think you might want to do? What are they? Well, what are the skill sets required for success in each of those? And you're doing homework, so you can't just, oh, what do you think? Oh, yeah, okay, I'll do that. No, no, you work at this. You spend some time at it. The one thing I didn't say before, though, in this entire spiritual science exercise, you can never show that to anybody, ever, ever. Because this is about you. God, it's about examination of conscience. You looking in the mirror, but the first time, and this is what happens a lot still, even you would say, don't do this. You turn around, you ask somebody, you look subconscious, you're looking for their approval. Bang, it kind of goes out the window. This is about you trying to get to know exactly who you are. Then you line up the skill sets. Do you have them? No? Bad, bad. Do you have them? Hmm. Yes. Area you really think you'd be passionate about? Because if you're not passionate about it, it's going to be a job. Job's going to be a real drag. If you are passionate about it, you're going to be ready to take out the challenges because you know you have the skill sets. You've already done your homework. You know the skills that are required for success. So you have those, and it's something, that, something that, that you care about. It takes work. It's not somebody's going to tell you. It's not a counselor. you got to figure that out. But 100%, that's the right. I know this over decades. 100%, that's the right advice. Most of the time, they go through the motions. If you really do take this seriously, it's a life changer. For me, I'd say the concept of BAM with spiritual science has been the differentiator for me in my life. Wow. Well, man, thank you so much. I really appreciate all you packed in here in this in, in just a shade under an hour. I, I'm, I'm really grateful for your investment of time. I know you're doing a lot of these, and it's, uh, it's really cool to get a chance to talk to you, Joe. Is there anywhere? Where would you, where would you, where would you send? Yeah, yeah. Where would you send my uh, viewers, listeners to learn more about you online? Uh, what was it? Moglia.com is the website. Moglia.com. Perfect. 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 And I, and certainly I, I would yeah. love to continue yeah. our dialogue, man, as we both progress and the things that we're working on. It's, uh, it's cool. I'd enjoy that as well, Ryan. I look forward to meeting you one of these days. Love to. Love to. Thanks so much, Joe. Appreciate it, man. Thank you for having me. It's been an honor. All right. Thanks, Ryan.